Hello, if you're out there, it's Greg Chambers, and I am uh, I'm hogging up the full screen just until we get started. It's 10.59, but we will start here pretty soon. So I'm going to share this screen so we can get started on talking about, you know, it's a topic that is super important, uh, but yet nobody wants to play with it. <laughs> I always said that uh, this is the kind of feature that we would uh, that when you need it, it's worth a lot. And so you'd pay any price to have the data that it provides. But long before you need it, when you're trying to get it set up, um, it's, it's always just too expensive to uh, to set up and to get using. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So it's 11 o'clock. My name is Greg Chambers. And I'm coming to you from uh, Lead Gen Compass. So today we're going to talk about uh, the details, right? Uh, it's uh, using Google Analytics for B2B lead generation. So this is a, a topic that is a uh, it's pretty basic, and most of most people that we work with already have analytics, um, but we bump into some pretty common problems with uh, their analytics setups, and that leads to um, challenges down the road when we're trying to generate leads. So I'm going to approach this just with a clean slate and uh, as if I'm talking to my friend Steve and I'm talking to Steve and I'm going to explain to him like what analytics is and why he needs it um, with his business. So if you have questions, I'm flying solo today, but if you have questions, um, use the chat box. You can use the chat and ask the questions and I will check it uh, periodically. And there's also a Q&A um, section. So if you have any uh, detailed questions, I'm happy to pop up uh, our analytics. I'll use US Farm Data's analytics and we can um, kind of go through there and I can talk about uh, if you have questions, where it is that, uh, how I would set it up and what it is that I would be looking for as we go through it. Most of these ideas that I'm going to give you today um, are coming from a book I wrote called The Human Being's Guide to Business Growth. So I'm not just a, uh, I'm not just making this stuff up. I've actually been doing it for hundreds of companies for a long period of time. And um, these are the ideas that I've kind of gleaned from uh, practice over time with a lot of different business to business companies. So what we'll cover today are uh, these bits. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, three ideas to frame our time together, uh, this brief uh, 30 to 40 minute um, foray into analytics. We'll talk about analytics. B2B lead generation uh, is our main focus. And then um, I'll cover some next steps if you haven't done them already. And then we'll get into uh, a Q&A so you can ask questions at that time. And that's usually when I'll, I'll dive into the, uh, the, the chat box. Um, and we'll go from there. Before we get started, though, I thought I'd, that I'd share some news that came out this summer that was interesting uh, to us. One is, it makes perfect sense, right? The, uh, the offline population has decreased substantially since 2000. So uh, we know this, and we know, especially during the pandemic, that it really did drop. But we always saw, what was funny is that I look at that 2015 number where it's 15% of people still weren't online. And there was a discussion at the time, and people would say like, well, my CEO, like our executive team, very few of them are really online. They're just not online at all. That has changed. Like we can say honestly, the the seven percent. I have no idea who these are, who, who these robots are. That they are not online. Um, it probably has to do with something with access um, in our society. But everybody who's able to get online in the last year and a half has gotten online. And not only are they online, they're getting really good at online. And so when we see that happen, uh, one of the things that we apply it to is what's happening inside of B two B business, uh, like how are sellers and buyers interacting? And Gartner puts out these reports, Gartner, the research group, puts out these reports. And one of the things that came out in one of their uh, more recent reports, uh, the end of last year, was how little uh, opportunity sellers, right, the people, uh, our regular salespeople, how little opportunity they have to influence the decision anymore, according to their research. So looking through this, uh, it, it, it's kind of striking, right? It's uh, we knew we know it's happening, um, but it's interesting to see Gartner put um, actual numbers behind it and have some interview uh, 
interviews that they did behind the whole thing. So that 17% that's highlighted is meeting with potential suppliers. So what are they doing? Well, uh, when they're making decisions, they are online. And if they're online, we need to be able to, uh, it helps, right? Just like you would ask your salespeople to keep track of their stats. Who are you calling on? Um, you know, how are, how are things going? How's the pipeline looking? Analytics helps us with the pipeline, probably a little bit more before the salespeople, but as we're finding it's, uh, that before the salesperson, before the sales tracking is taking up more and more of the buying process. So can we be where buyers are? So that really is uh, idea number one. The first idea that we're going to frame out is what is the role, like what is the role of your website in your sales cycle? It's not the same for everybody, right? So since we know that buyers are using online information, right? Um, the, the stats are proving this out do they use yours? Do they use your information? And where in the sales cycle do they use your information? If you've attended these before, you've heard me talk about, um, I use this little graphic, this little 80-20 Pareto principle, just broadly, where does business come from? On the right-hand side is, does it uh, start with uh, your buyers are out there searching? Um, and then uh, they come to the site the form and then follow up? Um, or is it the other way around where, you are introducing yourself to them. Uh, some other branding effort is happening and then they're hitting your, uh, but they're talking to a human being and then they hit the site to get more information, move through the rest of the sales cycle. That's just a, it's a, a broad cut where it's one is site first and the other one is site second or third. And based on uh, like your use of analytics is really gonna depend on where it fits into your sales cycle. And the one answer that is the wrong answer, and actually we just talked to a client the other day who gave us this, and it was basically saying, our people do not use, uh, like our buyers are, are not on the website at all. They're just not on the web at all. As we looked at before, we're saying that they're in the 7% then. So maybe if you're targeting farmers, I could see that. And uh, not only farmers, but farmers of a certain age, right? So like the greatest generation farmers, maybe they're not online. Um, but everybody else is probably online and they're probably using online for some form of research and where do we fit in? So I wanna know where that interaction is. So before we get started, that, that's usually one of the questions I start to ask is just kind of like, describe your sales process to me. And when you're describing your sales process, kind of tell me where, when you would expect that your buyer is looking for information um, that you're not providing, that a salesperson is not providing important information when it comes to uh, getting the most out of analytics for lead generation. Um, the second broad concept. So if the first broad concept is where in the sales cycle does your web presence fit in? The second one is there's a lot of people out there that are like data-driven, data-driven decisions, data-driven decisions. One of the things that we've uh, figured out over time is that analytics for all that, uh, for all the information that Google and Facebook and everybody has and Apple have on all of us, it's not always, it's uh, in the aggregate, it's pretty accurate. Um, when it comes to individual uh, items, it's not always so accurate, um, right? The, uh, I was telling somebody the story the, uh, yesterday actually about my daughter. So my daughter's name is Abigail and our last name is Chambers. And so uh, Abigail Chambers, uh, it was, it's Ashley Chamberlain started getting some uh, mail pieces to the household. And the household was, the mail pieces were like, you're expecting a baby's coming. And I was like, oh, this is funny. I think this is like, there's some mixed up data here because Ashley Chamberlain, it sounds an awful lot like Abby Chambers and, you know, who knows if there's even an Ashley Chamberlain in town. Um, well, the, uh, a week ago, I got uh, some free Similac. <laughs> so we're far from babies. She's uh, far from babies um, and she doesn't even live in Omaha. So the, uh, the, the Similac, you know, the, the marketing effort that is happening, this big database effort. Um, oftentimes when we get into the individual details, they're not as accurate as they are um, at the big. So when people say, uh, we want to be data-driven in our organization, we want our marketing to be data-driven, we've got all the information, we should be data-driven now. We aim more for just uh, data-informed. So if anybody's asking me like, oh, we're doing an email campaign and uh, I want to know how many opens and clicks there are. Um, I think that's the wrong information to focus on um, over time. Now, on the opposite end, though, I also think that uh, being 
just data ignorant. Like it feels like if you're operating on gut instinct and feel, we can get a little beyond that. So if we can be data informed, I use this grid on the side MQLs and SQLs just to, as, as a training tool with our marketing people and with our salespeople. And the big question is, right, uh, how valuable is the solution to the prospect according to them, right? So across the top, that's what you find on the x-axis is, it, does the prospect feel like your solution is, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting or it's, no, that's pretty significant or, oh my gosh, that, that would be game changing. Those are three different reactions that we can measure. And then on the left-hand side, the y-axis, it's, you know, is the prospect even aware of, the, of our solution um, as we're doing it, yes or no? And based on where you can put them on that grid, it's really like wh whether or not this is marketing's problem or this is uh, sales needs to start taking over. So in that lower left corner, like it's minor or maybe it's even significant, but the prospect's not aware of the solution, of not aware of us and not aware of our product. That's marketing job, right? Marketing job has got to at least move them up. Uh, the, the goal is always up and to the right. And so if we're trying to move up, can they at least be aware that we're out there and that they have this, they may have this problem um, and we may have a solution for this problem. The uh, moving it over to the other side though, is like whether or not it's minor, significant or game changing. And uh, if that's the prospect's impression of how valuable this solution is, that's really a sales problem, right? So when I say data informed versus data uh, driven, this data informed is uh, working in this world of, uh, you know, it's kind of fuzzy. We don't know what the delineation is between these lines often inside your company. So what we're interested in is we're less interested in like, oh, we, you know, there's 482 visitors that are coming to your site that look like they're in your target market. And it's more um, like, what are we doing with them afterwards? And then how does it fit into your general sales cycle? Those are the questions we're asking. So. Uh, there's that. And then um, I don't know if you had little kids with Dora the Explorer, but I always think when I see the map, I always think I'm the map, the map, um, the map, the map, the map, the uh, your customers buying decisions. So this third concept is uh, we need to know how our customers are making decisions. We all have a general idea of how our customers make decisions, but it really uh, helps even if the world is changing and they are using online uh, research more and more, and they're involving salespeople later and later in, the, in their uh, decision process, they still are going through roughly the same process, right? That this problem research options and best deal type thing, right? You know, like, what kind of problem do I have? Oh, I've got a transportation problem. Um, I need to get back and forth to work because um, I got a new job and it's predictable. And what are the different ways that I can get there? You know, that I can do public transit, I could buy a car, I could ride my bike, you know, whatever the choice is. And then as we uh, finish the research, we start getting into the options that are going to work for us. Like I need a car and it needs to, you know, be able to hold two car seats. So I need uh, some sort of sedan with four doors, right? And then we get into uh, like how, you know, what is the prices? And we work through that. Whether we do that online or offline, we're still going through the, roughly the same process in making a decision. We're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to get a result. And then working our way through this, the, if the customers are predictable, you want, we're mostly interested in where are they getting their information? And is that from you? So before we start getting too deep into analytics, these three questions um, are what we ask on the front end. And it's just, you know, where, where's the information coming from? Um, are we uh, aiming to be just data informed or we're trying to make better decisions internally uh, to help our customers? Or, um, and then uh, do we know how it is that they make decisions, right? I mean, there's probably a question that's before that, which is, do we even agree on the terms that are happening inside of our own sales cycle? Um, I don't know that, that that's necessarily the case. So these types of questions are, uh, I frame these out at the beginning because um, reading all the stuff that's happening with uh, AI and machine learning and what the Google ads is trying to do, what Facebook ads is trying to do, uh, Apple ads, what everybody's trying to do, they're like, we can help you predict um, where your leads are coming from. And we're really good, we're getting really good at this. But in order to do that, we need like a ton of data. And not only that, like on the user end, we need to know a lot about like what it is that you guys are trying to do. And usually like the more we learn about that, the more we're like, oh, this is where things are gonna fall apart. Like the, uh, the, the companies that can have these 
uh, have some of this stuff in place before they start applying these tools, they're the ones that are going to win in the next three to five years. And so um, we think that this is where it starts. And we think that, you know, those poor engineers are just sitting there like, you know, we can help you guys and we can get this stuff going, but your sales and marketing processes are so scattered and so driven by gut that um, we're not able to help you yet unless we understand how you can map out, like unless we understand how the whole process works, right? This is your internal sales process that you guys adhere to, whatever the labels are. This is my whole company agrees on it. And then this is my, um, uh, how my customers make decisions. And this is where the overlap is. And once we know those points, all the information's out there uh, to try to find out which people are researching online, where they're researching online. Some are probably still relying just on face-to-face. -face. Can we make sure our salespeople are talking to them in, at the right time? Um, but then other people are, have, are they're kind of pre-making decisions before they come to our salespeople. And can we let our salespeople uh, help them with that decision? So that's the big frame that we're working in. Uh, when it comes to analytics. So inside that big frame, what is it that you can do? Well, uh, I've got five maneuvers for you, right? Five little, uh, five dance steps that you can go through. And I titled them, this time I, I did them all with Bs. So um, we wanna make sure that we build in uh, analytics. We're gonna broadcast uh, analytics uh, to everybody. We're going to balance uh, analytics, I got to remember which why I chose balance, uh, then we're going to break it up and then we're going to begin. So these are the five maneuvers I'm going to talk you through. And if you have questions, by all means, throw them into the, uh, the chat box. But um, this is a pretty, it's a pretty broad overview. And then we'll get into details um, if you need them. But otherwise, I'll jump back and forth between the slides here. And uh, the, I have, I've also pulled up our analytics and some of the other things, some of the other uh, Google tools. So when I say build in, uh, Google Analytics should be on every page. And it may seem uh, silly to say that, but um, we bump into a sites that where Google is, Analytics is not installed correctly, um, or it's installed on just some of the sites, especially if there's like, a, you know, we use WordPress for a blog, but then we have a different site, or we have some old things that we've uh, piled on, or there's certain pages maybe that you don't want analytics to be on, um, making sure that those pages are pulled out. So we do, uh, we use Tag Assistant to help us with this. We, we generally build most of our sites inside of WordPress. And to make sure we're on every page, we just stick uh, the Tag Assistant which is a container that will hold analytics as well as any other uh, little string of code that we need to put in uh, on your site. Um, we put that in there because what uh, Tag Manager allows us to do, and let me grab a new share here. I will. So when you're inside of, like this is inside of our US farm data. When we use Tag Manager, what it allows us to do is that we can say, um, there's certain triggers that we want to, certain pages that we want things to happen on, um, but we only have to install this code once onto US Farm Data. So US Farm Data is a giant site. It's got a, a, a account engine in it so that people can build counts on the different types of farmers and ranchers. Um, so there's thousands of pages. And so to make sure that we're on every page, we put this container on every single page. But there's some of these triggers like AdWords conversion tracking we don't want to track that on every single page. So we might pick a, a particular page, but for the most part, like uh, Bing ads conversion tracking, we just put on you know every single page or our Facebook pixel ID or Google Analytics, there's Google Analytics. We'll stick that on all pages. So we like, we prefer that people use Tag Manager just because it's uh, a lot less stress on the web master. They can install code once and once it's uh, recorded, um, it's on there. Tag Assistant, oh, I guess I should have showed you the Tag Assistant. So I put Tag Assistant on here because this little tool. So if I turn on my Tag Assistant, it's a Chrome plugin. And if you, uh, you know, first you gotta enable it and then I record when I type in, you saw all those codes that we did. So if I say US farm data. .com, um, what it will do is as the code is running, it will tell you like, what are the, the tags that are inside there? So you can see Google Tag Manager, you can see, um, you know, the, the contained tags. 
um, what's inside there. Oops, it's not firing on that one. But you know, this is the code snippet, the data layer. This is uh, the stuff that's going on inside it, and uh, the URLs behind it. But it's an easy way to check and see if your Google, if your stuff is is working, is firing, right? So that's uh, the Google Tag Assistant. Um, Tag Manager is the tool which I described before, Tag Assistant, to help you um, make sure that you have uh, the tag firing. And then if you have tags going, watch out for sub accounts. So where we see sub accounts, we see sub accounts when um, you've had marketing agencies like us who've set things up, but when they set things up, they set it up like under their own code. So you see like a universal analytics code over here where it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, dash 32. That dash 32 means that your account number 32 under that code, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so why is this important? It's Google, I'm sure has maybe fixed it, but uh, we used to bump into this problem all the time where you couldn't get that old data. So if we wanted to go back three years and check out uh, trends that were happening on your site, but we were a different marketing agency than the current marketing agency. The current marketing agency couldn't really share this with us because they'd share, they'd have to share everything. So what we did is, uh, what we recommend is that you have your own setup and that you share out to the marketing agency is a pretty common way for that to go um, right now. The, uh, lately, Google has been pushing, and if you go do a Google setup, it will set up a brand new analytics account for you under their new analytics code. So they have a new version of analytics out. Um, I used I used the predecessor to Google Analytics um, way back when. We used we used to come through weblogs back in the day. Back in the day, we used to come through weblogs when we would uh, do that. Right. So Google Analytics was a, a giant advance. Plus, it was free. So you know everybody used it. That was great. Well, now they're changing it from that old Universal Analytics code, the UA code, to the new. I think it's G4 or something like that, Google code. We've been playing with it. You know, it's just like anything else. I can't find the things that I'm looking for necessarily inside of it. And as far as I could tell, it seems to be geared towards what's happening on your website. So going back to what the engineers are trying to get done, those engineers are really relying on your website is set up correctly um, to convert traffic so that they can tell you like what is good traffic and what is bad traffic based on the actions that people take on the site. E-commerce is the easiest way to do that, right? So if I'm selling a widget, you can come to my site, widgets.com. And then you can, you know, if you end up on the purchase page, you bought something that's a good indicator to Google that that was a, a good piece of traffic and then it can go find more traffic, right? The robot can go out and look for more traffic. For most of our B2B sales, we don't have those kinds of events, right? Even uh, US farm data, We've got a contact us form, but most of our uh, stuff comes to us through calls. People still pick up the phone after they've done a few counts. Um, one of the leading indicators they do is they'll do a count, right? They'll go to the, the website and they'll say like, you know, how many corn farmers are in Nebraska with over 250 uh, acres or something like that. Um, when they pull those counts, that's interesting to us um, as marketers, but it's really not anything that I want Google to solve for because then I just have a bunch of people doing counts. Um, what I'm looking, I'm more interested in the people that maybe do a count and then do a contact form or do a contact form. I'm interested in the people who do the calls, but we don't have our system set up to track that for a, another host of reasons. But um, the, again, the new analytics code is set up. It seems to be set up to track a lot of activity that's on the page. We use Google Analytics mostly to help determine whether or not the traffic that's coming in is good traffic or bad traffic, right? It all starts with traffic. Uh, to us, everything starts with the list. And then the people coming to our website, it's like, uh, it's a giant list and it's kind of full of a bunch of stuff. And so how do we determine good traffic from bad traffic is, the, is our approach to using analytics. So that all starts though with the, the theme of this, of this slide was really just make sure that it's all built in, that, um, that you build in analytics onto every page so that we can track something. And I would recommend um, using both forms of code, right? You can put the new code and the old code both into Google Tag Manager and you'll get two different views of the traffic that's coming in. That seems to be working fine for the clients that we've done that with. So that's number one. Number two, broadcast. 
Um, broadcasting is, uh, in this sense, what I'm talking about is sharing results internally as to what's happening on the website. The one thing about analytics, if you've ever uh, installed it and looked in on it, it's just got a ton of information, uh, more information than you need because it's really built to ask answer questions, right? It's uh, it's not a great tool for giving you questions. It's a great tool for answering questions. As a matter of fact, the latest version or the, the last year or so, the version of analytics, it's got a little like AI bot bar up on top. It's like, ask me anything kind of, uh, and it'll, I'll, I'll use your analytics to answer that question. Um, that requires the setup to be happening, right? But um, before then, it's like to determine whether or not or what kinds of questions you would like to be asking or what you should ask. We start with a real simple uh, metric, right? A, a process that we look at and we say, what is the site traffic? And then show us what they're doing when they're on the site. So what is the site activity? And then for any goals that we have set up, like anything that we hope that they would do, give us the activity for that. And if we, look at analytics, analytics is pretty much set up this way, but we can build a custom report um, that does the same thing, right? It um, Inside of analytics, it tells us where's the traffic coming from. So you can see in this little map, if you see down there, there's a little, in the United States, there's a little dark thing right around Omaha. So I think this was an Omaha thing that I had pulled traffic for. And uh, where's the traffic coming from? And then what are they doing on the site? You know, how much time are they spending on the site? How many pages are they, are they consuming? Uh, how many are new versus returning visitors? And then on the other side is goals. Like, what are we asking them to do and how many of them are doing it and what, where is it coming from? So I can see on that goal side um, a little bit of, yeah, so this is, I think, a, a lawyer that we work with, the uh, how many chats, uh, online chats are initiated and where did those things come from? The one thing about uh, analytics is, it's more information than you've ever had about what's going on in your website, but it's not 100% of the information that is in there, right? It's not 100% accurate, I should say. Um, tracking breaks all the time, just between uh, things. So like, for instance, one of the things that we always like to look at is uh, organic traffic, like how much traffic is coming from the search engines um, that uh, match up with what people are searching for on the search engines. And we can pay for some of that traffic, but we also attract some of it uh, organically, right? Where we don't pay for it. So we're, uh, the question we have is uh, how much of that is coming in? One of the things we notice over time is that organic traffic and direct traffic moved up and down together uh, all the time. And so as, as our organic traffic grows, our direct traffic goes, we started to figure out, you know what? It's somewhere in direct traffic is some of these broken pieces that are happening. So to us, organic and direct is all the same thing. Like if we if we can get those numbers to climb, um, we're getting, we're doing a good job with uh, attracting the right kind of traffic, um, maybe, right? That depends on site activity. So we can get a lot of organic traffic, but we do want to see what it is they're doing on the site. And then we would love to have them accomplish certain tasks, whether it's like the US farm data site, whether it's completing a count, Right, that is an indicator to us that we've found some good traffic because they're at least curious as to how many people we have in our list, all the way to the obvious make a phone call um, or uh, fill out a form uh, kinds of things. So the first one was, um, what did we say? We said build it on every page. The second one is broadcast your results, share it with everybody. And so as we're talking about goals, that's really the next one. And that's, um, we like to balance the goals within what is happening inside the buyer's decision process. So let's talk about that, right? So if we've mapped our buyer's decision process, we would like to take that idea of like, where are they at? Are they more in the like, what is this all about um, stage of decision-making or are they in the like, how exactly do I solve this um, bit? And we can kind of tease some of that out if we know what's going on. I'll use an example. So there was a, uh, an alternative capital lender that we work with. And uh, in there, the question was like, where does the site fit in? The site is not like, there's nobody that was looking for these guys. Um, and, uh, you know, it, or at least we couldn't figure it out. So, cause it's a lot of, um, it, it, it's a lot of, it depends. Like they needed, they did, for instance, one of the things they did was medical lien funding. And so uh, inside of a medical practice, it may only be, like 95% of their uh, business is not medical lien related. So they're interested in that uh, 
accounts with that 5%. And to find them, what they were searching for was kind of hard. So they use salespeople. And so the salespeople would go out and um, generate the business. And then the question was, what does the website do to help that? So at first, what we noticed is that the, um, the traffic would come in on the sales reps. So for instance, Greg Chambers being a sales rep um, has a profile on there in the bio, like the About Us. And so you could get into Greg Chambers and then um, we'd see that traffic start to lift. So that's, it was just an early indicator of, you know, we've got five salespeople and they're out there banging around. And sure enough, uh, the more they bang around, the more you see traffic to them go up as people are, who knows what they're doing, just doing research, like who is this yokel that's calling me? Um, who is this Craig Chambers? And so uh, once we'd established that and we were going back to like, what, how does this match up with the sales cycle? Like what was happening with the sales cycle? One of the things that we were told was that the, um, the last person to see them was the CEO, who is not this guy at the time, it was another guy but he was the last one calling in. And so what we were there is we were like, oh, okay, so you're kind of like the mystery guy who comes in at the very end to negotiate the final bit of the deal. And um, that's why there was so much traffic on his profile, like his profile. So, right, it's uh, all the reps, but then there's also traffic on him. So we put their pictures up uh, front and center. So it was him and th this guy was a, a partner and then the CEO, and we'd put the CEO there and give them the hero status. That that shot on a website is often called the hero shot, and because uh, it makes them look like a hero, right? And so this is the hero shot um, of them. And but the whole idea was that we were trying to build up the perception of them before they went and talked to the people that they were talking to. So the reps were in there working through this person, talking to them, and then they're like, okay, at the very end here, we need to. The, all deals need to be approved by the CEO. So here comes the CEO. Well, if they visited the website at all, they saw the CEO on the front page. And so that's what we were talking about. Like um, the way, like the, to answering this question, like how do we know this to be true? Like how do we know that people are looking at the website? Well, because you guys are out there making calls, we can see traffic to the website increasing. Not only that, we can see, you know, so-and-so is talking to more people than others when they go to and present at a workshop um, or present at a conference, traffic to the site would go up but that, uh, from that area of the country, um, but then also uh, traffic to that profile. And so how do we take advantage of that? Because where does that fit into the buyer's decision process? Those are the questions that we're looking for. So when we are setting up our goals, right? So if we go back to this page and we say that we're looking at site activity and then we're trying to determine what the best goals are, the best goals are the ones that are tied into the decision process, um, answering this question, right? So that we're always after it, like, how do we know that this is going to fit in with uh, what it is that, uh, that we're after? So some are easy to find. Um, other ones like this was really not so easy, right? But this is a, um, the, the team, the executive team stuck with it because they did see traffic increasing and they knew that some of their content was getting out there, especially for people that weren't ready for the business. You know, sales reps are calling on them, but they're probably years away from needing their services. Um, plus they didn't even know that they have the problem. So the problem's just been introduced to them. They're really early in the process. Helping them through that, that's uh, how do we establish goals for them in analytics so that we can be better at uh, business to business lead generation. So we did that. So let me pop through this. The um, the other piece is to break up, um, what am I saying here? We wanna separate interesting info from important information. Google gives you, uh, your website generates a lot of interesting information. Uh, this is all interesting, but how do you know which parts are important? So in general, when uh, describing, so now I'll talk to the marketers in the room. The, if you're a marketer and you're trying to describe what's going on on your website to your executives, the less detail, the better, right? So um, the more detailed you are, the less interesting you are inside there. And executives already know this, right? They're like, yeah, I want, uh, I just need broad-based things that I can make decisions on and, and trends that I can see. I don't need to know how the whole thing is made. The, uh, one of the challenges though, is that with analytics, it feels like we really have all this great information um, at our fingertips. And so if you've never heard the, parable of the blind people looking at the elephant 
And so there's the, you know, seven or six blind people, they're all inspecting a different part of the elephant. And, you know, the first one up front, he's like, oh, I, uh, this horn, I've got this horn, you know, I know what this is, this has got to be uh, a, a rhinoceros, you know, feel the, the strength of this horn. And the person in back is like, no, no, the, you know, the, I've got this tail, it's got to be a, a, a horse, you know, horse or something, you know, because I got this floppy tail. And then uh, everybody else has got their own interpretation of what it is that it is. And nobody's really getting the full picture. That happens a lot inside of analytics and when we start to dig into analytics. Last touch um, at trying to break advertising into silos, um, using funnels to drive uh, leads. All of these things kind of add up to uh, giving you kind of like the blind person and the elephant. It gives you just a very small piece and doesn't give you the whole picture of what's going on. So we recommend that um, instead of trying to break things into smaller pieces, that you uh, put, you keep things, the one that you track the most is the broadest. So for instance, uh, inbound calls. So, um, and I'll show you one of these um, at coming up on a, a future slide, but uh, number of calls and number of leads is way more important to us uh, as a metric and as a let's follow this metric than traffic and uh, you know how much we're paying for uh, traffic at a particular point in time, right? We're gonna aggregate all that information and we're not gonna say like, what is our Facebook traffic giving us? Instead, we're saying like, how is all of our online paid traffic, how's all our online organic traffic working uh, towards influencing these numbers? Because if organic traffic is going up and leads are going up, that's a good thing. So um, avoid the, the wanting to uh, only focus on what is super interesting and just focus on the important information is there. So um, the last one I have for you is uh, begin. And this is um, this is what I was referring to in, in that last slide. And it's, uh, so if analytics is on the front end, I'm, I'm interested in uh, certain types of information, right? One is leading, like, can we uh, pull any leading indicators in? Cause that helps us with prediction. And then what are the lagging indicators? Sales is the ultimate lagging indicator. Um, traffic to your site is a super leading indicator. Um, which one's most important? I don't know, but I wanna keep track of all of them so I can see changes. And I love to see changes week to week. I love to see changes month to month. Uh, quarter to quarter and year to year, because uh, you know, is there seasonality in the business? Is there this and that? You can't answer any of these questions if you don't have analytics uh, installed and working properly. So at the very, very beginning, I was talking about uh, how much something is worth. When you're trying to make good decisions and trying to uh, tease information out of the data that's gonna help you uh, with some growth initiative, it is uh, date, good data at that point, good analytics having been set up is super important because you can ask it a ton of questions um, and really get good stuff out of it. If you haven't set it up, right? Like, if, so three years before that growth initiative, it's really not that important to you. So um, I, what I'm saying is the way that the world is going in the next three to five years, you will see a lot more um, AI and machine learning driven decisions coming your way. And the more information you have to give to the machine, the better the information that's going to spit, it's going to spit out at you, right? The better it is going to be able, at being able to predict your leads. We've got an internal tool that we've been working on and trying to uh, hone for some time now. And that's really what uh, it's trying to do is it's trying to discern like a lead comes in and how quickly can the machine score it before the human can score it because we don't wanna waste their time, right? We have uh, too many leads for the number of people. So if we can kind of brush the leads out and separate them successfully, uh, right? Nobody wants to turn it on right away because uh, you don't wanna lose any revenue. <laughs> but um, the goal is to get it to where it's smart enough that we uh, can figure out how to make it work. The only way to do it is you need to be collecting information and this isn't even the best information analytics, isn't the best. But this report I'm showing you on the right-hand side, that's a three-year leading indicator report that we use uh, for US farm data. So, and the way it, it rolls is uh, traffic to uh, people who are searching, uh, completing a search on the site, right? So like engaged traffic. So there's all traffic, engaged traffic, 
number of phone calls that come in on the queue and uh, the uh, number of leads that make it into the system that are uh, qualified as leads that we're going to follow up on. And so by tracking those numbers across, not any one of them shows us all that much week to week, but in the aggregate, we can start to see, you know, like, okay, 30% growth. What, what it pointed out to us is um, if we got a big bump in uh, traffic that also uh, did counts, right? So good traffic on the front end that it took about six months for it to show up in the leads side, but it did show up. You started to see where when you tried to pull those, those graphs together, the overlay would really happen um, about six months down the road is where it started to match up where it was kind of making sense. So we were catching people early, which was exciting to know. Um, but then also it was probably more exciting to know that uh, they were turning into leads because our first experiments, we were spending a fortune on traffic. And when that traffic doesn't come in right away and turn into revenue right away, you get a little concerned. So uh, by keeping track of all this stuff, we were able to go back and uh, build a good business case for maybe we should be investing more um, over time. So the best way to do it is to start. Um, and I have one extra thing for you um, that really doesn't have uh, its analytics, but inside of analytics, there's a couple other tools that Google has that really do help. One is search, um, the search console. So the search console gives you a little information on organic traffic. Um, it's not the best because they like to aggregate um, where we love, we love seeing those long tail terms where we can, you know, tease out like this is exactly what this guy is looking for and how best to answer his question. Um, and do we have an answer for this question, you know, whether or not it's good traffic that happens inside of, well, you used to be able to see it in search console, but now it's all shortened and aggregated, which is fine. It just means that we need to buy some traffic. So ads is when you hook all three of these things together, um, it really does help give you a picture of where your lead generation efforts are coming from. So at the very least, hook all those things up. Google's got another tool called Data Studio. Um, uh, I'm not, we're not the best at using this because uh, we, we pull information from uh, too many other places. So, um, but it, I've seen people who use it successfully. I'm always jealous, but it's out there. You should play with it if you're going to play with it. And then um, with, uh, you've probably heard some of the things about privacy, right? With uh, Apple um, cutting off their, cutting off our devices um, from being tracked. And then um, uh, inside of the apps, we're not doing as much tracking and, and, re and reporting. And so, yeah, it's, it's affecting Facebook. It's affecting uh, Snap. Snapchat released some ad uh, dip that they've had because targeting is less uh, robust. Um, one of the things you can do inside of Facebook, inside of Google, is you can load your own data in. So inside of analytics, if you go into the admin tool, you will see a place where you can upload your information. Again, um, your customer information, your prospect information, the more you know about what's good and what's bad about it, and then stick it up into analytics, you can start building some filters and you can start figuring out um, who best to uh, work with and where best to get information. So that's, a, that's a, I told you I was gonna give you five, I, th I threw in uh, number six because as I was going through it. So let's uh, run through these one more time real quick. Um, framing this conversation, we wanna know about where the website, like to begin with, we always just think to ourselves, where is our online stuff and that could be, it could be um, apps, it could be any tools that we use online, where do they fit into our customer's life? And um, once we know that, um, we can start collecting the data, right? And then when we collect the data, it's a, there's a real temptation to draw straight lines through and say, you know, like we're going to, um, we just wanna find out exactly what our Facebook traffic is doing. Uh, it's better to be data informed, like uh, we can see that data is, that Facebook is having a positive or negative influence is probably a better way of using some of that data. And it's really at that level that you get the most out of it as opposed to trying to figure out um, exactly what works and why. Um, there are people in your organization that should do that, but for the most part, um, if you're running a marketing team, it's best to stay uh, data informed. And then uh, mapping, mapping a sales process internally, agreeing on terms, as well as knowing uh, how you would describe your customer's buying decision 
um, getting those two things working together, it's still like the, one of the more powerful ways to uh, grow your business super fast. Um, when it comes to using analytics, make sure it's it's building into it's build. I probably should have said built in. It's built into every single page. Uh, share reporting internally at a at a high level. Uh, traffic, you know, like traffic. Where is it coming from? Website activity. What are they doing? And then any goals. Uh, where are those coming from? Um, try to balance. Try to uh, map those things back and forth between your customers and um, your sales cycle. The the more you can. Uh, tightly integrate that, the the better off uh, you are long term. Um, breakup. So breakup was one of those where I had done it. But, oh, this break up your interesting from your um, important information, right? Uh, it all is. It all should be interesting. Don't get too much down the rabbit hole. Uh, try to stick on the most important things. Uh, for instance, the uh, like leading versus lagging indicators. Just knowing what those two things are, and then begin. Um, getting started and then uh, taking information out and yes, good old fashioned spreadsheets uh, still work for helping us uh, see information in a good way. Um, I get a lot out of populating spreadsheets uh, myself. There's something about the, the act of transposing information that helps me get an overall picture of the health of, of a lead generation program. And then the bonus information was, you know, if you got, if you're going to use somebody's free tool, Regardless of what you think about Google, if when it comes to lead generation, if you hook all three of those things together, Google uh, Analytics, Google Ads, and uh, Google Search Console, um, you do get a clearer picture of what is what the most dominant search engine is doing and what uh, people that are coming from that site are doing for you. So if there's any questions, um, I'm sure you would have asked them by now, right? But you can, at any time, you can stick it in the chat or you can email me. I'm greg.chambers at leadgencompass.com. And uh, for next steps, I would check uh, the installation um, of your tag manager and connect with Google other Google products. We do it all the time. I actually, I, tr I train the reps. I'm like, reps, this is the, the first place you start. Go look for analytics. Because if you don't see analytics, it's really hard for us to do a bunch of work. Um, we'd rather be pleasantly surprised by somebody saying, oh, we don't use Google Analytics. We use, you know, uh, something uh, Adobe or something like something super great and expensive. But oftentimes what we find is people are like, ah, you know, the website, I'm not sure if anybody's using it. And, uh, you know, we, we hate it. We, we, don't, we don't have anybody around who can mess with it. So we just leave it alone. Um, getting uh, the Google products set up, um, we do a lot of just that where it's like, you know, uh, let's talk again in six months, but first let's at least hook up your um, hook up your products and then um, come to some sort of agreement on your internal sales cycle and customer decision process labels. If you can get those things working together, um, that is uh, going to help you the most. And then, you know, how do we know this to be true is a, a question that we ask internally all the time and uh, you should be asking it also. So we can help. If you can tell us what you need more of and where you are today, we can generally help. And then um, we can also set up measurement systems that fit your unique situations. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, in general, uh, the feedback we get is that it is helpful. And then once again, we'll uh, provide the recording, get that out to you. Um, but uh, analytics, super boring, uh, basic tool. It's like getting into the weight room every day. Uh, get into the weight room every day, but uh, make sure you're tracking what's going on. Um, uh, Noom, right? My wife was playing with Noom, the new app on track. It's just an analytics tool, right? You got to feed information into it and it tells you how you're doing. Get the information so that you can get the rest of it done. Thanks for your attention. I guess I ran over today, 45 minutes, and uh, we will talk to you soon. <laughs>